Hey guys, how are you? You're listening to Vol SC. Today we are going to talk about military orders, the sectorial of Pan Oceania that primarily involves the knights, the space knights, the thing that's closest to the space marines. And for that reason, um, well, not just that reason, but that's one of the reasons that uh, it's a beloved faction. A lot of people really love military orders and look forward to playing them and collecting them and talk about them a fair bit. So today I'm going to be focusing on the sectorial, giving a breakdown of every, pretty much every profile, talking a bit about strategy and list building and uh, more so for newer players, uh, less advanced players telling you a bit more about how you might want to approach them and play them and, uh, and hopefully win with them as well. So join me as we go through this overview. So military orders, um, being a Pan-Oceania faction, suffers from the same usual things that most Pan-Oceania uh, sectorials do, and that is the lack of uh, the smaller smoke-throwing cheerleaders and impetuous guys running around everywhere. Um, also, they don't have a extremely strong hacking game. Uh, again, their specialists uh, are weak to average in terms of willpower. And you've got the generally the, the, the same old um, thing there with uh, the, the, the weaknesses and deficiencies that you see elsewhere in Pan Oceania. Although you have Joan of Arc in this uh, sectorial, she doesn't have access to quite as many of the little um, mercenaries that are irregular, which she can turn into regulars. And uh, they've got a couple of tag choices, but unlike uh, basic Pan Oceania, um, you don't have a lot of them there. What you do have instead is access to some very interesting link teams and the ability to form together your brotherhood of knights and go on a crusade and uh, approach the game that way. In terms of archetype, I look at this and I go, well... Um, there are several ways to approach you know, playing this faction and building lists for them. First of all, what you can legitimately do is take advantage of the fact that order sergeants are availability unlimited, and you can put together a list which includes a lot of them. And on top of that, you take the remotes, the cheerleaders, all the little bits and pieces, doctor, engineer, and you can make a fairly robust list that you know, goes to 15, 16 orders if you really want to, maybe even more. That's one way of playing them. The disadvantage to that particular archetype is that you uh, aren't really pressing on the strengths of the sectorial. You're going to be up against other factions out there that are doing a similar sort of thing, taking that many orders, but just being a bit more efficient with it. Um, and of course, this is a sectorial that doesn't have access to any of the, the big names like Fatality Level 2, Jammers, uh, Symbiomates, Posthumans, the things in the game that are very, very powerful. But you can make a decently robust, sizable list with military orders if you want to. The other way to go with military orders is to have Joan of Arc or even uh, Deferson leading a really powerful pain train of just uh, your elite knights, for example, uh, hospitaliers with possibly some Santiago knights mixed in, or maybe even just hospitaliers. But if you're going that way, it makes more sense to have Joan lead them. And in that sense, you've got this pain train. In, uh, in comparing them to other pain train style lists out there in Infinity, these guys are nowhere near the capability of uh, Zhu Yongs, for example, with all the tactical awareness, in terms of being able to mobilize and go around the battlefield and be efficient. They're also uh, lacking what Kornak and his squad have, and that is the immunity to jammers and some really high hacking resistance uh, from Kornak there. And Kornak, of course, does have the tactical awareness. What the knights tend to bring, though, that uh, some of these other uh, very recognizable pain train style lists don't, is that they've got martial arts, and even though they're not spectacular in close combat, they have stealth, which means that they can more easily avoid those uh, jammer, jamming attempts and the hacking attempts that might happen in midfield, which would be more of a problem for um, those other link teams that I mentioned. If you compare them to, say, uh, the Dumarus and Harumaki, not Harumaki, Tankos from, from JSA, yes, the Japanese have stealth as well, but they don't have the guns that Pan Oceania do. So what you're seeing here is the, uh, the capability of making a uh, limited insertion list, which is around a single uh, powerful link team with great guns and stealth, and that's their draw. I played that for a little while, and um, it's definitely playable and viable. But um, takes a bit of thinking and uh, perseverance and care. You can't really afford to make a lot of mistakes. And I feel like uh, this is a faction which is not really that forgiving. 
If you go and play Toha, for example, there's a lot of stuff there which is quite forgiving with the symbiont armor and symbiont mates. Or OSS, uh, you've got a lot of NWI stuff, um, some nice high stats for your, your shooters, and uh, marker state everywhere. Um, you, you see a bit more forgivability, and, and less so, I think, in this faction. So uh, we talked about larger lists, we talked about smaller lists. Another way you can build um, uh, military orders, which I'm going to discuss in this video, is that you can go for a relatively small, maybe limited assertion lists, and you will include the order sergeants in this one, but we now have the capability to bring in the Father Knights and actually have a very robust sort of defensive link team with the Father Knights in there uh, with all of the link bonuses, and suddenly your Blister Skill 14 and your Armor 5, uh, BTS 9, and your loadout of a Missile Launcher uh, look very appealing. And that's something I'm going to talk about in this video because previously in history, military orders couldn't really do anything like that. And this is one sectorial that really has been changed up quite a lot over the years. They used to have Fusiliers in there, now they don't. Uh, Previously, they were very limited in what link teams they could form. Now they have a lot more um, varied options. Uh, you look at some other sectorials, like, for example, Corregidor, which have seen changes, but nowhere near as many changes as this uh, sectorial has. Lastly, um, one other way to go with building lists for a military orders, I believe, is to really base it around the Magister Knights and uh, include a Santiago, a Santiago in there, as you would with your other link teams and uh, the Teuton, which it's built around. And we'll discuss that a bit more, but I think in the meta at the moment, if you're really serious about playing military orders, uh, probably at the top of your mind is going to be using that combination in some manner. You've got the, the cheapness and the efficiency of the Magisters and the Link team managing to um, mitigate their weakness, which is uh, their Extreme Impetuous, and the ability to throw in wild cards in there, which um, are very, very strong and useful. And that's something we're going to be talking about quite a lot in this video. Well, let's get, get down to it. We've got Army 6 right here. We're going to go right back to the beginning. And I am, as usual, going to go through each of the profiles. And we'll talk about them. And we'll discuss their merits or lack of merit. And we'll have a good time. Where am I going to put this? Over here. So we'll start off with the Diapho character, Indigo Brother Constantinos. When I look at this guy, I like him on paper. But for some reason, I never ended up putting him in any of my military orders lists. And when I see other people playing military orders, I really just didn't see him on the table at all. I, I think I've seen him maybe once or twice in five years of playing. So why might that be? His cost isn't, you know, completely exorbitant. Uh, if we look at the basic guy who is going to go on the link team here, the non-infiltration one, that's MSV2 with a combi rifle in your link team. The only problem with MSV2 is that it's not a very good ability to have if you've got a very short-range gun and you start a long way away from them. What I mean by that is that you might be up against a TO sniper, but um, although you're getting around the minus six penalty of his TO, if you're shooting at long range and up against cover, you're still at minus, minus six anyway. So imagine him in a link team with Bliss Skill 12, bumped up to 15. He's throwing four dice in his combi rifle, but you don't quite get into that 16 inch range band you decide to use at long range. Well, you're back down to nines on four dice up against them shooting back at you. And even if they're like a post human sniper or whatever it may be, um, they're still hitting you on their 13s on two dice. And it just doesn't really feel very good. Uh, you also have the ability to bring in the Blackfire instead if you're going to be going down that path, so he's competing with this multi-rifle now. And the multi-rifle, uh, definitely a better gun uh, if you're going to be doing a lot of work than the, the combi rifle, right? What about the Specialist Infiltration? Well, if you take that option, he just doesn't have the Link Team bonuses. There is the Assault Pistol, which is really nice, but again, this is not a sectorial which can combo his ability with any smoke. Um, he is not in mark state when he uh, deploys out in the midfield. If you're taking the second turn, uh, he's going to be out in the midfield and he's going to be very killable by other marker infiltrators out there. And if you deploy him too far back, well, you're essentially wasting 34 points on that kind of ability. Then you go over at the order sergeants and you look at what you can get for them. I mean, we're talking 27 points here, 33 points here. For a guy that's in um, TO camo state and deploys out there and can do a range of different things. So for that comparison, Constantinos probably shouldn't see a lot of play. I still, I still look at him and go, it's a shame. You know, it's 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 great to have twenty nine points, MSV two sticking there, and um, if you for some reason find yourself building a list and there's that many points left over at the end, and you've got a defensive link team that you know you're going to be moving out with, 
Uh, I don't think it's a bad choice to put him in there. Um, I, I definitely prefer the, the basic linkable version more so than the infiltrating one. Because uh, the infiltrating one, I just in in the majority of situations, he's not going to be better than the uh, order sergeant, um, the special uh, order sergeant with Tio Camo. So it's a shame. Uh, he's not one of the better Diaphos characters in the game, but he's not the worst either. I'll say that. Machinist, not too much to say about this guy. We know about him from Pano in general, and honestly, um, you're going to be taking a Machinist if you also take a Tag or maybe a Bulleteer, but if your list is primarily just Knights and Troopers that, you know, aren't really going to benefit from Engineer apart from possibly uh, removing Isolation status or something like that, then you can leave this guy at home. So it's really dependent on what else is going in your list. If you are going to be taking a Machinist, uh, taking a Tech B is really not a bad idea. Sometimes you'll even have a Tech B without the Machinist, to be honest, especially if you've got Joan of Arc, uh, because five points for a Specialist and the ability to turn that regular order into a command token, uh, into a, uh, sorry, the irregular into a regular with a command token is very useful. And obviously this uh, Tech B is a no-brainer if you have a Joan in your list. For people who are very new players, um, it might need to be said to you that um, this remote assistant level one ability means that you're plus one willpower on your on your engineers so it, it means that the engineer goes from his uh, very uh, unfortunately weak willpower of 12 up to willpower of 13 which is a bit more substantial and it makes that 15 point expenditure for him a little bit more reasonable shall we say all right let's get down to order, order sergeants because this is uh, supposed to be the bread and butter, the meat and potatoes, the bricks and mortar of the faction. Uh, funnily enough though, uh, there's going to be a lot of military order lists which don't really include many of them, but as you can see from availability total, what you really could do if, you, if you're crazy, like if you really wanted to, is you could go through and you could make a, a list entirely of TO Camo guys. I'm not saying you should do this, but let's just do the mass right here. I mean, if we just put in 10 of these guys, we can actually afford them all. We could swap one out for a, a, a um, lieutenant, for example, but um, it's possible to have a crazy military orders like this if you really are insane. But for the same reason that people don't run you know, lots and lots of ninjas and unwabans and, and stuff in JSA, you wouldn't really run this either. The point is, is though, that you know, what about four of them, for example? Um, there are going to be some viable lists which have four of them. You could have two uh, Ford Observers and two Multi Snipers. And then you build the rest of the list around that. You've got your basic defensive link team, a lot of uh, cheerleaders and so forth. And you still maybe have 14, 15 orders, but you've got a lot of TO markers out there to play with. And that's just something that military orders can do. So don't forget that if you're going to be a military orders player, if you like the idea of being very stealthy and covert, despite being the Space Knights crusading through the galaxy, uh, this may be for you. So that's their availability. Let's talk about some of the profiles. You've got your basic line trooper. Now, I'll say it again. Sadly, uh, Fusiliers aren't really an option in this sectorial anymore, which is a little bit of a nerf because there are, there are times where you want to take the Fusiliers because they're cheaper. You're paying 13 points for a very basic line infantry guy with Bliss skill 12. And it interests me that you're paying a bit extra to have Bliss skill 12 on a trooper like this, even though when you form link teams, it's most uh, mostly going to be something else than link team doing the shooting that's not an order sergeant, because they pa can pair up with a Blackfire. They can have a Father Knight join them. They can have a Knight Santiago join them. So um, it's just a bit of a shame that you're not sort of uh, able to fork out, say, 10 points for a, a Fusilier or um, have a Trooper that's a lower list of skill. But look, that's not a really big deal. It's not a huge consideration. You've got Willpower 13 there, so that's nice. Otherwise, not too much to say about them. The multi-sniper guy, um, you know, you're paying pretty normal points for a multi-sniper there on a light infantry trooper. But again, try not to go crazy on that because the point of, of these guys in a defensive capacity is to take the cheap dudes, the combi rifle, paramedic, that kind of thing. Maybe the hacker, since nothing else in the faction, as far as I'm aware, can be a, a regular hacker. Maybe I haven't looked very carefully. I probably haven't, but... Um, if you're going to be wanting to put assisted fire onto a bulleteer, for example, or a, a TR bot, then he's going to be in there. And once you've chosen that little group of a few guys, you're ultimately going to be wanting to add other things in. 
So you chuck in your maybe a, a Lieutenant San Diego Spitfire, for example, or a Father Knight Missile Launcher, and that's usually how you're going to be playing your defensive Order Sergeant Link team. The Knights are going to be doing the shooting, the Order Sergeants are going to be there to keep the, the costs down. So when you're looking at Order Sergeants, looking at their profile, try not to look at them in terms of what they can achieve in terms of their fighting. They are really there to support so when we go and look at the Spitfire profile and the heavy rocket launcher profiles, again, I don't think that's really the best way to play military orders. Don't use the order sergeants for the straight up shooting unless you're going with the special sergeants in terms of the multi-sniper or maybe the, the infiltrating um, combi rifle. I will say that the specialist sergeant with the MSV2 Spitfire, that looks appealing, doesn't it, on paper? But for some reason, the MSV2 guys in the Special uh, Sergeant category camp, and it says down here, Specialist Sergeants cannot be members of a fire team. So would you really want to just have a random guy, 24 points, with MSV2 and a Spitfire wandering around by himself without link team bonuses? I'm going to argue that you wouldn't. Uh, if we come over here to look at a Bulleteer, for 23 points and less SWCs, you're getting ODD instead of MSV2, but you're getting assisted fire instead of no bonuses, and you're getting 6-4 speed instead of 4-4 speed. And really, if you're going to be playing that kind of Spitfire role as a solo piece, stick with the Bulleteer armbot. I mean, the Bulleteer, we'll talk about it a bit more later, but it's definitely in the top 10 profiles of Infinity in general, which is really saying something because there's a lot of profiles now. So, of note, in the Order Sergeant lineup, just the basics, I reckon. The Hacker, I think that's the best way to get a, a Hacker into your list. Um, and then just the basic 13-point uh, pleb there. Maybe a Paramedic if you don't feel like you can have other specialists in there. But to be honest, you may not even need the Paramedic. Because you're probably going to be adding in um, the San Diego, who, who is going to be a specialist anyway. You've got the Hacker, which is a specialist. You may not need anything other than the basics. And to be honest, um, this might even just be it. Note that one thing you can do elsewhere here is you can add a single Father Knight to a core... Um, sorry, I've got it the other way around. You can add a single Order Sergeant to a Hospitaliers or Teuton Knights fire team. So that's where you take your single um, Sergeant, may as well make it the most useful one, the Hacker in this case. Then you add it to the Teuton Knights. So maybe we're going to Teuton Lieutenant or maybe the Spitfire NCO, the two interesting profiles there. Then you add the the Magisters to that. So you might have a Panzerfaust missile launcher. Then you throw in your Santiago. So that, in a lot of lists, might be the only place we actually see, that, see a, a, an actual sergeant. And sorry, guys, I keep getting this wrong. The specialist sergeant uh, hacker is actually not able to join a link team. So my bad. It is going to be the para paramedic if you want a specialist or just the basic 13-point guy if you want to keep your points low. I always get that wrong. So again, military orders players... Got to have a close look. I wish that Army 6 would categorize them a better, bit better and have all of the basic order sergeants at the top and the specialist sergeants at the bottom, but it get, catches you out. So you've got three order sergeants there, then all the spec sergeants, then a couple of basic order sergeants, and the spec sergeant at the end. So there you go. Um, I don't think that this is a case of you know five order sergeants all in the same link team. I don't think that's the best way to really uh, get the optimal um, optimal list going with this faction. Tech Beast, again, um, an absolute must if you're taking Joan of Arc because it's a five-point regular order. Um, it's a really decent choice if you're running a machinist and a bulleteer. Um, but otherwise, you can feel free to leave the Tech Bee at home. Same with the War Corps. If you've got three points left at the end and if it's going to be more useful than a Palbot, throw them in. Uh, with Joan of Arc, of course, he becomes a three-point regular order, in which case you're definitely going to want to take him. Crusader Brethren. Uh, these guys are very interesting because it's a multi-rifle possibility on a AD deployment uh, profile, which is rare. It's not common to have that sort of shock ammunition uh, multi-rifle on your drop trooper, and to have a light flamethrower on there is really, really cool. So if you're going to be taking this guy, that's the way I would go. I don't really like the idea of using them in a limited insertion list. Um, I think with limited insertion, the lists that I like are the compact Father Knights and Order Sergeants group, plus a tag, plus a few other bits and pieces, some specialist sergeants, and keep it as a you know solid uh, group of 10. 
The Crusader Brethren, I think, is going to be something I would look at if I'm going out to that more robust 14, 15, 16 order lineup with a lot of uh, cheaper units and um, more specialist sergeants spread around. Um, this guy could maybe go into group two. You've got your spe spec sergeant hacker for your bulleteer for assistive fire, but also control jump. Or on missions where you're going to be taking a Evo repeater anyway, like tic tac toe, and since you've already got that there, may as well use the efficiency of that um, that buff onto dropping down on this guy. He's only physical 11, so it only takes you up to phys 14 for the drop, which is not the best. There are definitely higher phys troopers out there in the game, but getting that sweet multi rifle on the back line is pretty cool. We could devote an entire other Infinity video to talking about the theory behind loadouts. This is always very interesting. There's a case for all of these guys. Different range bands right here. Combi, HMG, boarding shotgun, spitfire, multi-rifle, flamethrower. Um, there's a time and place for all of these, really. And it's going to come down to personal taste. It's quite subjective. And I'm not going to sit here and lecture you guys about why a spitfire is better than a boarding shotgun or an HMG is better than a multi-rifle. Um, it's going to depend on your style and your kinds of opponents and the missions and the kinds of tables you play on. But it is very eyebrow raising that the multi rifle's in there, and um, if you're going to give this guy a go, I would seriously recommend the multi rifle um, as something you're you're looking at first. The Black Friar. Um, I've never been a huge fan of the Black Friar, and let's break it down a little bit. We'll talk about the multi sniper first, and then the multi rifle second, because it's almost like these are two totally separate units. With the multi sniper, we can compare him to the uh, uh, what do you call it? The Niss Sniper in Vanilla, or the Kamau Sniper, or the new Upsilon from O12. And all of those three units are better than the Black Friar because they have mimetism, right? All of them have MSV2, but this guy loses out on mimetism and doesn't really uh, get a big points decrease as a result. The Nanopulse is not going to come up a whole lot. He is not immune to shock, and it's just going to be a BS13 guy sitting out there. One thing I can't really understand about him is that in uh, Varuna, for example, your Kamau can join a link team, whereas in Military Orders, which isn't as strong a sectorial as Varuna, arguably, the, uh, the multi-sniper version can't even join a link team, whereas the multi-rifle can. And I really don't think it would make the, the model too powerful to have the multi-sniper link team. And the argument for that is that you've already got the Kamau on a link team and the game's still playable. I think that's too strong because it's got mimetism as well. But um, why not let the let the Blackfire do that as well if you're going to go do that and allow the allow Varuna to have that option? So that's a bit of a shame. In this sectorial, I wouldn't really recommend just running a Blackfire unless you're having heaps of trouble with people using impetuous smoke grenades all day long. Uh, and even then, I mean, he's going to get shot pretty reliably. Um, this is a sectorial where you get um, the TO snipers and the spec sergeants. You've got the Father Night missile launcher link team now. And you also have the wonderful Magisters, of course, in a full link team with the Panzerfaust and missile launchers. So they are better ARO pieces, in my view, than the MSV2 Blackfriar sniper. I know he's got MSV2, guys, but um, it's not that great when he's just by himself unsupported. The multi-rifle guy is uh, a little bit more interesting. I still don't love him, but I think he's definitely more viable than the multi-sniper. Sometimes albedo is going to really be a wonderful thing if you're up against that intruder or that marut or something like that. He does start in your deployment zone with plus four inches for being a medium infantry. He's 4-2 speed, and he's got to get the enemy within 16 inches for his multi-rifle to really be good. And as he's moving out there, he's throwing a few drop bears. Um, I don't think that he's the best you know, profile you've got access to into this faction. He's probably not the worst either. Some of the time, it's going to be okay to have him in with your link team of Order Sergeants and Father Knights. So you might see a combination like this. You've got him there with a the multi-rifle. You take a really basic spec sergeant. You throw in your uh, Santiago um, lieutenant, maybe. Uh, or even just the deflector. And then you take the, uh, the Father Knight there with the missile launcher and the lieutenant Spitfire, for example. And you've got a very strong five-man link team. But as you're moving up the field, you may encounter a situation where the Blackfriar is going to be a better choice uh, to shoot them with than the lieutenant is. 
uh, if, for example, M albedo is kicking in, or if um, you are up against something with ODD, Tio Camera, for example, where your odds are going to be better than the um, Father Knight's odds would have, even though he's got better blister skill and more dice. Having said that, though, looking at this particular loadout, um, honestly, um, I think that I would rather just drop the Black Friar and take another Order Sergeant and um, and use his points elsewhere. But I don't know. I haven't really given him a lot of a lot of testing in the the, the battlefield. The model's kind of cool. Um, again, if I saw him in somebody's list, I wouldn't go. Ugh, you know, that's a terrible choice. Um, I think he's viable. He just doesn't scream efficiency at me. He doesn't scream synergy, right? Okay, so that's the uh, rough uh, breakdown of the Black Friar. Let's move on to the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. Or Sepulchre. I'm not too sure how you, how you pronounce that word. So this guy has the age-old problem in that Hollow Projector Level 2 has for a long time been a, a weak ability. And at the most fundamental level, if your opponent is always able to just declare delay whenever you do anything, um, it sort of ruins the efficiency of, of, of Hollow Projector Level 2. It's going to become very predictable as to which uh, the real model is as you're moving around because, you know, you're going to be putting the model in the spot next to cover where it's going to shoot. So it's hard to surprise anybody. In the reactive turn, again, um, if you're going to be shooting back at them, you reveal your guy and you have to do that after they clear the ARO. It'd be kind of a, a cool ability to have in combination with some kind of sixth sense in the same way that the chasseur is a marker. So if you move in range of the chasseur, it delays, and if you discover it, it just shoots you with a flamethrower. So imagine this this model with sixth sense level one. So you move in range of one of the hollow um, echoes, and um, maybe you're in range of several of them, and the knight simply declares a delay and doesn't reveal which what the real one is. If you keep moving, the, the knight pops out and shoots you, for example. But look, just not the case. So what's happening here is that um, the enemy's going to be shooting empty hollow projectors. Maybe that will uh, come in handy, but uh, a lot of good players are just going to figure out which one the real one is. And um, it'll be very quick before the hollow echoes are gone, and he's just a you know plain old knight sitting out there, BS fourteen armor, three two wounds, but you know fifty odd points. So if this guy didn't have hollow projector level two, you compare his stats to the stats you're getting from these guys, hospitalian knights, uh, father knights, that kind of thing, and you feel like you're paying a little bit too many points uh, for him. I will say though that Hollow Projector Level 2 um, is very useful for clearing mines and clearing crazy koalas and that kind of thing. And um, also, if your opponent's coming out of Marker State or Hidden Deployment to try and hit you with a jammer or a hacking attempt and gets the wrong Hollow Echo, that can really save your skin. So think of it that way. Try and just squeeze out those extra few bits of efficiency if you're going to be running a guy like this. It's cool that he now has a four deployment level two and a light grenade launcher. That is interesting, right? So that's the kind of uh, play I'd be wanting to make. BS-14 and a light grenade launcher. Invest in a guy like that for really putting the hurt on getting first turn. It's just not going to be very powerful in games where you don't have first turn, so it's not that reliable. The chain of command thing. Um, chain of command is great, uh, but the thing is... If your lieutenant's going to be a knight like a father knight or a Joan of Arc, it's usually pretty easy to keep those models alive anyway. So yeah, um, again, he's not the best profile in the world, but he's not the worst. I think he's kind of viable. Uh, I don't feel like this, uh, this unit really suits my style. Maybe it doesn't suit yours either. Another problem is that usually your list is going to be wanting to achieve a certain thing. It's going to be wanting to uh, provide a vehicle for your link team to get into position and do a lot of damage or support your tag, for example. And there may just not be many points left in the overall plan. Uh, so this guy kind of has to have a link list built around him. If I'm going to be playing him, maybe I'd be going for um, the grenade launcher, for example, and I'd be having a, a bigger list which can really fuel him, and he's going to be very order hungry, and I'd have fewer things in the in the list which need orders of their own, and just hope that he does a lot of damage with that light grenade launcher, regardless of whether I go first or second, and um, the hollow projector may enable me to move up with him. Um, the other guy who doesn't have four deployment level two may sometimes use the hollow projector level two as, in fact, hollow projector level one instead, and be a bit tricksy. You might be able to hollow projector him as uh, something really squishy that your opponent needs to go after, and then they're ending up against a, a knight. Uh, it used to be that you could take a fusilier lieutenant as your uh, lieutenant, I think. 
For some reason, you can't take an order sergeant lieutenant, which is kind of lame. But if you could, then the holo projected uh, holy sepulcher guy would perhaps, you know, try and pretend to be your lieutenant in that regard. But since your lieutenant options are going to be these other guys anyway, um, I just don't really see that happening as much. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a little bit a little bit limited, you know, what you can do with this guy. Um, other players may have better tricks, but for me, uh, I'm just seeing a little bit um, a little bit lackluster for this particular dude. He needs a little bit of a points decrease, or he needs Hollow Projector level two to work a bit harder for him. Gabriel Deferson um, hasn't been in a very good place for a while, and my real trepidation with this character is that he is super vulnerable to a hacking program like Maestro from long range. So you show up at your tournament, you've got your shiny new military orders, you've got your big badass link team, and Gabriel Deferson smack dang, dang in the middle of it, and you're up against an Onyx player, and the first thing that Onyx player does is he fires a pitcher across the table very reliably with Kurnow, and then he activates Kurnow, and he's got Maestro in the link team, and he goes after you. And um, to be honest, uh, Gabriel Deferson wouldn't be ignoring the firewall of that repeater because he has an assault hacking device, not a killer hacking device. He's got the upgrade, which is a killer hacking upgrade, but that doesn't count for uh, the purposes of ignoring the firewall because he doesn't have a killer hacking device. So chances are he loses the face-to-face -face roll. He goes from two wounds to zero wounds just by failing a single BTS check, and then your opponent can do something else to his corpse and kill him, and you lose a 56-point model, which may or may not be your lieutenant. So that's pretty bad. I will say that with the advent of the Knight San Diego Deflector, that does change things a little bit. So that pitcher comes in. Maybe if you're lucky, you've put your two models very close together and your opponent doesn't measure the range, uh, doesn't guess the range right, and he's having to go up against your Knight San Diego and Deferson. But even then, I'm a little bit worried about that because in that sort of scenario, what Kurnow can do is he can split burst between the two of them. Or what I would do is I would just let him um, uh, go for the Trinity and just uh, maybe blow up the Knight Santiago first. Actually, no, that plan wouldn't quite work because if um, Deferson does win, um, he would have shock on, um, on his Trinity, wouldn't he? But um, the, the point is that... <sighs> You've really got to keep them close together for it to work. Um, if you end your turn where uh, the Santiago and Deferson are too far apart, they can land their pitcher in such a way that only Deferson with is within 8 inches of the pitcher, not the Santiago. And even if they are very close together, a very, very good player can fire the pitcher to a point where, um, because that person's so good at guessing ranges, the pitcher will be exactly eight inches away from Deferson and not the Santiago. And uh, Deferson's really only benefiting from a minus three from the deflector, but Kurnow will have his own deflector and the firewall and will have the active turn with the plus three, minus three, and, De and, and Deferson will just die. So that's not great, is it? Having said that, um, as long as you're confident he's not going to run into that situation, um, he can be useful. If you're playing um, in a tournament and you've got one list with Deferson and one list that doesn't have Deferson, then if you run into like Nomads and Onyx and those kind of situations, even Foreign Company with Laxmi, what you could do is just play your other list that doesn't have Deferson in there, or play Deferson if you're up against um, people that aren't going to have a lot of really dangerous killer hackers with pitches, for example, if you're feeling confident. Still, he is a lot of points. Um, you can still get a, st a specialist in there without having to spend so many points. You can still get a, a decent BS-14 Spitfire by just grabbing a Santiago over here without having to p spend as many points. And at least with this BS-14 Spitfire, you're getting EM grenades and other various uh, bonuses. He is very good in close combat, but um, maybe you'd be investing in Joan anyway. If we have a look at uh, Joan's uh, cost, Joan is actually cheaper than Deferson, and Joan is slightly better in close combat, and she's a new lieutenant. She's got all of those other really awesome abilities that Deferson doesn't. So I'm skeptical about him. I don't think that he is particularly good. Um, I do see people try him every now and again. But uh, I wouldn't want to take a model that has such a liability um, with ha uh, killer hackers being so powerful in this game and having such a, a massive threat range these days and so many different upgrades that um, this guy would have trouble keeping up. You know, how bad would it feel to lose a 56 model point model in one order to something like that? So be careful about taking him. I know it looks cool. He's got a new model upgrade, but just be careful. 
Moving on to the hospital knights, the hospitaliers. These guys um, by themselves are a bit bland. You know, you you buy a um, a straight up two wound guy who's hackable with you know decent bliss skill, but um, no other mods. What I wouldn't recommend is just running around the battlefield with one of these freelance by himself trying to get a lot of work done. The time that you want to run the Hospitaliers is where you're going to be committed to having that strong link, right? Right, so Hospitaliers. If you're going to be playing it this way, what you're going to be wanting to do is have that pain train going. You've got your HMG in there, Doctor Combi Rifle. You could take the Multi-Rifle Doctor, but since you're probably going to be having a Multi-Rifle in there anyway in the form of Joan of Arc Lieutenant, um, I think leave him at home, and then you can take a boarding shotgun as well, and of course you're probably going to be wanting the deflector. Um, it does say here that up to one order sergeant can join a not knight hospitaliers uh, link team, except crusade fire teams though, so Joan of Arc, um, the crusade fire team is where she is in the link, so that wouldn't allow you to bring an order sergeant, but if you drop Joan of Arc out, you could take the order sergeant, if I'm reading that correctly, maybe I'm not, but this is the link team that I like. And we talked about it earlier. These guys all have stealth, so if they want to avoid the jammers and the hacking for a while, they can. If they run into a really nasty uh, assault hacker out in the field, they've got that deflector. You might even have put up Fairy Dust earlier in the game. And that uh, Knight Santiago killer hacker with deflector in the link team is very potent for destroying enemy hackers out in the midfield, especially those uh, assault hackers. I love that Joan of Arc as the lieutenant can um, break the link and move them uh, with a coordinated order from her lieutenant uh, ability. Uh, and I do like the fact that she, instead of doing that, she could break the link team and just kill one small cheerleader by herself, then reform the link team. So it's, it's like giving you an, an additional order. You don't have anywhere near the threat range that Invincible Army and Deshart do and uh, Morats do with their tactical awareness. So bear that in mind. But I did try these guys for a month or two, and I played a lot of games with just limited insertion Joan. And so long as you're bold and courageous and rush across the table to get the job done, um, once you camp in their territory, they're really hard to shift because their bliss skill is so extremely high. They may, may have already punched you in the face hard enough that you've lost some of the things to counter them. And what you can do with this team is you can support them with um, possibly some order sergeant snipers. The way I used to play it is I'd throw in a couple of multi snipers, and what I'd do is I'd move them to one corner of the battlefield. And I'd have the, multi, the snipers in position where if the enemies cross their own deployment zone to try and um, tie them up in close combat and throw smoke grenades, the snipers would be covering their position. There's a few bat reps uh, from uh, earlier, I think this year or last year, where I was doing that. And go have a look for them because they're a lot of fun. Uh, military orders has actually been buffed since I was playing them uh, because they weren't able to take that Santiago killer hacker in the team before, but they can now. So this is one viable way to play military orders. I don't think it is the most viable way, but um, it is playable. You're not just going to lose every game as a result of taking too few guys or some problems with the knights. They have the tools to do it. But again, not the most forgiving. They do require a bit of care and practice and thought and skill. So don't be uh, put off. If you give it a go and lose a couple of games, keep at it is my advice to you. Okay, so that's Knight Hospitaliers, Martial Arts Level 2, uh, but they have stealth with that. And although they're religious, uh, Joan of Arc's um, uh, ability there, Inspiring Leadership, gives everybody courage. And that may mean that you can choose to fail your guts check um, instead of having to take the religious role. So don't forget about that as well. It's also nice that the um, Hospitaliers have that, hoc that doctor in there too. Uh, uh, just your portable doctor, which is coming along with the link. So if one of them does get rendered unconscious, you could bring them back. Let's go and talk about Joan now. So Joan has two incarnations, the uh, level one and level two, the version two. By far the more popular of the two versions is the standard Joan of Arc. And the one profile that we see more often than not is the Lieutenant option with the double action close combat weapon. I really wouldn't recommend bothering taking Joan of Arc unless she's going to be a lieutenant. It really makes no sense to spend all of those points on this model, who's not a purely combat model. She's just got a multi-rifle starts in a deployment zone, so spending 50 points for that is not worth it. But it definitely is worth it 
for inspiring leadership because although you spend the extra points on her, you save so many points elsewhere by, be, by being able to take the Tech B and the War Core for just eight points and you get two regular orders out of that. So it's almost like a, a big discount overall. So think of it as a discount on Joan herself. That's the way I like to look at it. Instead of paying SWCs for her, you gain extra SWCs for your list. So when you're looking at all those Magisters or uh, TR bots or whatever it may be, the TO Sniper, Order Sergeants, all the SWCs you're spending on them, you can spend an extra point because you had Joan as your, as your leader. And it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but hey, if you're a military orders player, you should take every advantage you could get. And that is a really decent advantage, being able to have seven SWCs effectively in a, um, in a normal tournament list, which is so strong. So Joan of Arc um, can be played as your link team leader in your very powerful pain train Hospitalia's link. It is possible to play her as a standalone and just supporting the rest of the list, although that's something she does better in vanilla. If I'm going to be playing Joan in military orders, I definitely would be wanting to play her with the Hospitalias. Otherwise, I'd rather take the cheaper options, really, because it's only two irregular orders, which irregulars, which are becoming regulars, not like five. Comparing her again to the mobility armor. So the, again, the problem with the mobility armor is that for a similar number of points, you're losing a couple of points of armor, which doesn't feel great. Losing one point of fizz, which doesn't feel great. Uh, the 6-2 speed can be useful when you're running and gunning. But I just don't like the fact that you're spending SWCs on her instead of gaining them. So she doesn't help the list overall as much. Um, just having a look at it, the lieutenant option, and you'd always want the lieutenant option, has an AP close combat weapon instead of the EXP or double action, which kind of feels a bit lame. Um, and armor three, man. I mean, you want her to survive. She's gonna be your lieutenant. Um, that that inspiring leadership is so important to Pan Oceania and military orders. So that profile just to me doesn't quite cut it. And if you're gonna put her in a link team, there's gonna be something else there with a the Spitfire and HMG to do that job. Um, whereas I really like Joan positioned as the multi rifle person. You know, something that's gonna uh, take hold close range once you close the distance. So for me, um, without saying too much more about it and breaking down the stats anymore, just take my word for it that the main recommendation here is the, the lieutenant. Also, if I've, if I've forgotten to say so, a lot of these knights have frenzy. And um, before I get too, far, far further, too much further forward into this, I think it's really worth saying that uh, frenzy is a uh, problem if you're killing things and finding yourself uh, impetuous and not having cover anymore. But because you have access to link teams, that's uh, something which can mitigate it because you're never impetuous while you're in a linked team. Speaking of impetuous, let's come to the Magister Knights. And I think that these guys are very special and uh, one of the best things about military orders as a sectorial. You wouldn't often take Magister Knights on their own in Vanilla Pano, although I've been known to when I played Vanilla Pano just because I like them so much and because I like working with um, Extreme Impetuous. So with Extreme Impetuous, you get a points discount because extremely impetuous is normally a bad thing. You know, you lose cover and you're forced to run towards the enemy unless you spend in order to restrain them. But going into link team means that you don't even uh, factor in extreme impetuous. You get cover back and you don't have to move around. But you still uh, retain the, the, the points reduction. Really important. These guys are really nice and survivable uh, with two wounds in hyperdynamics. Uh, so they're dodging on 17s. So they're almost like adding cheerleaders into your link team that can fight. BS-12 going up to BS-15 in AROs with the Panzerfaust, so your opponent comes in the line of sight of one of them, and two Panzerfausts coming right at them can be really a liability, like really risky for your opponent. Again, martial arts gives them stealth. Uh, hy hyperdynamics, uh, we already talked about that. And the light shotguns uh, may be something that you'll, the rest of your link team doesn't have access to. Then there's the missile launcher for just 32 points. You've got a really big beefy missile launcher there. Only BS-12 going up to 15, so not the best, but still really decent. And it's cheap as chips. So what you can do then is count them as Teuton Knights, so long as you've got at least one Teuton Knight in there. In fact, um, because that counts as, you may not even need to. 
I sometimes forget what the new rules are, but I think if it says counts as Teuton Knights, you could simply put in one Magister Knight, and then other things can join that knight as if it was a Teuton. It, it doesn't say can join Teuton Knights, so uh, that would be different. But having said that, the Teuton Knights have changed in a way that you might even want to take one Lieutenant for the sake of having a Lieutenant there if you don't have Joan of Arc in your list, or the NCO for the ability to actually use the Lieutenant's Order on the Link Team. But we'll come back to them in a minute. Magister Knights, I think, are where it's at for competitive uh, military orders play because they allow you to have a very efficient link team without really breaking the bank. It's not even a bad idea to have a couple um, free range, you know, just roaming the battlefield with their um, impetuous because they can move up and they can get into the midfield where they're really annoying with their light shotguns and their dodge ability and they're going to take so much effort to remove with direct template weapons and, and that kind of thing. They're good in close combat, so it's hard to kill them that way. Uh, so they can be very useful harassment units midfield. Um, or even just hanging out around the back of your lines with a Panzerfaust. That's a BS-12 Panzerfaust, which um, could be really annoying for your opponent. They may be able to beat it in a face-to-face -face role. You might be able to do guts prone behind cover, especially if you have courage due to martial arts. Very, very useful unit. So start thinking about how you can incorporate these into your lists if you're planning on playing uh, military orders. And I believe the models got updated as well, so there's some fresh new sculpts for them as far as I recall. Montessa Order Motorized Knights. This is an interesting addition to military orders. I'm not 100% sure if I like it. I don't want to write these guys off and dismiss them and say that they are not very good. Neither do I want to say that these guys are a must and that you know you need a base list around them. So let's have a talk about them. The fact that he's got martial arts and a bike means that you've got a stealth bike, so you might be able to avoid hacking and jammers by doing that. His guns are very short range, so on an open table you might find yourself coming into a, a shootout where you don't really have the odds to beat your opponent and he's very order efficient once he gets there. On a bit more of a cluttered table, I think that's where he might be able to shine. Just driving through and weaving through the terrain and getting to a point where his 8 inch speed brings him around the corner, brings him to within range of that multi-rifle or boarding shotgun or even chain colt, and then he can let rip with it. It's not like uh, a cum rider, for example, where for 10 or 14 points you're driving across there covering yourself with smoke and then uh, expending that model um, for, for troops that are more expensive. Some of the time, this guy is going to net some kills, but not really enough kills to justify his points cost or the, order expenditure, or the order expenditure that you put on him to get him out there. And I think that's the problem. What we've got to try and consider and work out um, in an abstract way is what percentage of the time does this guy just provide no value? So he's driving across the battlefield and some old uh, TO sniper or TO missile launcher just uh, kills him or he runs into some sort of hacking or jamming that he wasn't expecting to, or he drives in and fluffs his roll and just gets killed. How often does that happen? It's going to happen a non-zero percentage of the time. Like it's, it's not going to be half the time, but it's going to happen a significant amount of the time. Then you look at the other extreme side, where he drives through and he just blasts everybody and doesn't die and he kills things. Then there's the medium range, where maybe he, he does some damage, but only just enough to justify himself, or not enough. And... You compare this to other troopers out there in Infinity, which, um, you know, let's say a Bulleteer, for example, there are so many games where this guy easily provides his value, and very few games where he doesn't do anything. Um, so a model like this is one that you see in lists way more often, whereas the bike um, is a bit more questionable. When it comes to the bike, I think that uh, this is a model that is going to be of interest to pl players who play a lot of military orders and they're maybe getting a bit bored of the other options and they have tested them out a lot and they've got a lot of um, clever players up their sleeves. For newer players, I can really see you running into trouble with them. Just getting into scenarios where you weren't, where you were expecting him to be very useful, but him turning out not to be. Don't forget that he can't claim cover with his um, with his impetuous, so his armor four might look pretty strong, but it is just armor four. Yeah, it is a bit awkward. At least he can drive through mines and things. Um, being on a bike is going to make it harder for him to dodge crazy koalas and mad traps with the new new O12. Don't forget that. Um, this guy's going to be pretty terrible against riot stoppers and mad traps, that kind of thing. Uh, because his two wounds aren't going to make any difference against that sort of immobilization. 
So yeah, just be careful. Um, it's cool that you can take a paramedic so you can drive out to the objectives, but again, um, I think if, if you're just gonna be thinking about button pressing, that's probably better achieved with your specialist sergeant Ford observers. Yeah, uh, he's not terrible, he's not amazing. Um, I'll be interested to see what they do with the model. Um, personally, I kind of liked the um, the mechanized um, uh, version with the, uh, the the light grenade launcher, but I suppose they do have the, the sepulcher, sepulcher Knight now for that. Although this guy's like 55 points, so I, I prefer the old version of the Montessa Knight, to be honest with you. Father Knights, ever since Operation Ice Storm came out, we were always looking at that beautiful big knight with his massive claymore or whatever it's called, the great sword. And um, when you come down to his stats though, he doesn't have any um, any mods for shooting. No MSV, no mimetism or anything like that, no ODD, starts in deployment zone. And his, his main draw is that he's Bliss Score 14, which is strong. He's got a little bit of close combat potential and he's BTS 9, armor 5. So he's tough. But you pay a lot of points for that, and it's kind of hard to justify him when he's just sitting there by himself. You pay a few extra points for a CC23 and Assault, but that definitely doesn't make him better than a CC Specialist. I mean, you go up against something like a Damaru, uh, they're just going to you know wipe the floor with you because of MA3, right? He doesn't seem to have stealth there, so despite BTS9, he's not really avoiding those hacking attempts and the jammers like you'd want him to, right? BTS-9 is nice, doesn't come up all that often, does make him a little bit less likely to be hacked, but you're still having to try and reset and avoid hacking. If he does get hacked, he's he's still going to be uh, a complete statue. He's going to be really terrible, just like any other heavy infantry trooper. I remember sometimes running him as my lieutenant in a mission like, mission like hunting party, because if you know your opponent's going to be trying to hunt him down with hacking and isolation, that kind of thing, BTS-9 is very useful. But overall, the Father Knight... Uh, takes a bit of a back seat to uh, other heavy infantry in the game. He's never been thought of as one of the better heavy infantry models at all. Until more recently when, uh, of course, Corvus Belli changed him to say that he can now join a fire team of, um, of water sergeants. And that's where we finally see the Father Knight appear in competitive ITS lists. And I'm all about that. I love the Father Knight and I'm celebrating. So one profile that I really loved and that I used to take, um, even by himself, although it was kind of silly, is just the missile launcher. The thing about a missile launcher is that it's a very defensive um, ARO piece, and you want an extra dice if you're AROing, and you'd certainly get that from the Link team. You want uh, something durable, because you know that you're going to be losing some of the face-to-face -face rolls, and finally having an armor 5 piece there makes a big difference. If you're going to be taking hit after hit after hit from something like a bulleteer, the difference between armor 3 and armor 5 when you're in cover is significant. And having two wounds there to mean that you don't immediately go and go to um, like the dead state removed from the table is really, really important. So suddenly you've got a guy sitting there, and if it's an open table, he's covering this huge amount of space. He's ballistic still 17, he's ignoring surprise shot, you can't use the smoke MSV2 combo because of your 6th sense level 2 on the link team, and a lot of shots are going to be tanked because of armor 5. Even something firing a viral rifle at him, like a Major Luna with her, um, her marksmanship level X, you've got a BTS-9 guy in cover with two wounds, and that's not going to go down easily against Major Luna. And of course, you're firing back at her with your MS, uh, sorry, your Bliss Skill 17 missile launcher. So even if there's a saturation zone because of power pack or something like that, this guy is really, really scary and suddenly becomes worth it for 49 points. It is a big investment, but the strength of that ARO, I think, is really a big deal. The other profile, which I really quite like, is the um, either the Lieutenant Ford Observer, really cool little specialist there, or even just the, the Father Knight Lieutenant Spitfire. Because you're going to use this guy as your lieutenant, he's going to be hiding a lot of the time, but when it comes time to move out with him and attack, um, if you're attacking with a BS-17 guy, he's unlikely to take a lot of, you know, shots back at him that are going to win. So you're very unlikely to lose your lieutenant in that regard. And then you can start to put together a bit of a list, right? So you've got the, um, the hacker with the deflector level 1 going in there, then you've got a couple of auto sergeants to go in there, um, just a couple of plebs, right? In fact, I might even throw in the paramedic, just because the paramedic might be clutch when you move out there and you do want to revive somebody. You spent over half your allocation for this list, but it's going to be a limited insertion list. So what I like to do is throw in a Seraph, 
HMG Serif, and then um, what you can do is just um, take the, the button presses, so maybe an auto sergeant uh, like this, and um, you want a doctor as well, just in case your um, missile launcher Father Knight goes down, and you've got a few points left over, maybe you could throw in a, um, uh, just a Fugazi, um, maybe even um, a Tech B at this point, uh, you might want to mix and match this a bit more, but you can sort of see the beginnings of a very robust limited insertion list here where if you want to attack, if you go in first, you're fueling your orders into the Seraph, which now has tactical awareness. Um, you can move out there with an 11 order push, maybe get a few kills, drive them back again. Um, if you're going second, you've got the Seraph to do a bit of defending, but of course that missile launcher Father Knight's in there to defend as well. And you can probably hold on for a while. Then later in the game, you make that really dedicated charge by moving the Father Knight Link Team out and going on a crushing uh, Wrecking Ball run with this group and you're very resilient against hacking thanks to the, the Santiago hacker and of course he makes a great specialist as well. So that's the kind of thing you can achieve with Father Knights now and I really do like it. The Father Knight sculpts are also really amazing. Um, gives you a great opportunity to do some painting and uh, have some centerpiece models right in there. Looking quickly at their other profiles, um, honestly there's nothing wrong with them, it's just that um, those are the two standout ones for me. Boarding shotgun, sure. Uh, I mean, I suppose you could take three Father Knights in the same Link team, but you've got to start to manage your points at some stage, I feel. Um, you don't want to sort of splash out too much. Like, I mean, the Salt Hack can go in there, but he's, he's having the same issues that DeFerson did against enemy, enemy hackers. If you're going to have a hacker, it may as well be the Santiago Knight, shouldn't it? So Spitfire's cool, or maybe the Ford Observer version. Those guys are pretty cool. Um, or the Missile Launcher, which used to be a really a maligned piece, now a really, really viable piece. Uh, San Diego's, we've been talking quite a bit about the star of the show, which is the Hacker Killer Hack device with the uh, Tin Bot. Really, really useful. Never forget that he comes with his D-Charge as a Nanopulsar, and that's something which you don't necessarily get unless you're running Drone. Let's talk briefly about the other two, though. So you can have a Lieutenant in there. Remember, that's a wild card Lieutenant who can go on any team. Um, these guys do bring in the EM grenades, and with such high physical of 13, that can be very strong, bearing in mind that you get to throw twice being in the link team, and you get the uh, bliss skill bonus by being a link team, even if you're spec firing. So that can be clutch um, at times. The charge is going to be useful for some classified objectives. Um, BS14 means he's just as good at shooting a Spitfire as the, or, um, the Father Knights are. It's just that he's not as well armored, right? Martial Arts Level 1, again for Stealth, Kinematic Level 1, uh, just pretty standard stuff. The 360 Visor and Zero G are abilities that aren't going to come up that much, but they will come up sometimes. Um, this Specialist Operative over here, well, you, that's just basically the difference between the Lieutenant and not the Lieutenant. So we actually save um, 0 S, 0 0.5 SWCs for taking a Lieutenant there, which is not bad. Um, just remember that uh, every point you spend on a guy, um, actually no, hang on, I'm thinking around this the wrong way. Normally, taking a Spitfire on, on a heavy infantry model that was going to be a link team would cost you like two SWCs, whereas this guy's getting it for just one, which is nice. So, um, all of these profiles, really, really viable. It's just the killer hacker you'll be seeing the most because the deflector level one's so useful. And having a killer hacking device to defend your friendly uh, knights from enemy hacking is, is pretty important. Teutonic Knights now um, used to be very weak. Um, a lot of people said that they were one of the few models in the game that needed a buff. I think that they're better now that they can be linkable with things that aren't Teutonic Knights. So you've got one guy in there to benefit from Berserk, for example. So if you want to throw in this Combi Rifle Panzerfaust guy, that can be really strong because if you're moving out with your Link Team and he goes in to fight something, um, he's really just going to wallop them with Berserk and the Explosive Close Combat Weapon and the Burst Bonus from his friends. So if you're trying to destroy a really tough target, that's just going to go down really, really quickly. Um, he can be a lieutenant option, which I think is fine. Um, it may be a bit of a struggle to find other lieutenants out there since the order sergeants can't be a lieutenant. You may not want to take Joan. You may want to take the Santiago Killer Hacker, but not one of the other ones. You may not want a uh, Father Knight in there. So if it's coming down to that, um, this guy is probably going to be a useful lieutenant to have in there. The NCO is also of interest because if your lieutenant um, is spending the uh, lieutenant order, it's going to break the link team, whereas if the NCO model does it, the link team can still shuffle along an extra order without breaking the link. 
that's very, very useful. These other ones, maybe not that great, unless you're going to be running like a special Harris Fire team uh, with the Teutonic Knight, that may crop up in some lists. Um, I'm not going to cover that too much, but it's definitely there. Don't forget about that, because that specific three-man group um, could be three different models, just the way that the sectorial works. Um, but yeah, uh, Teutonic Knights have gone from being a model you'd almost never see on the table to suddenly being one of the uh, useful key pieces of a military orders list because they combo so well with the Magisters and the San Diegos. And I think that's probably the, the strongest combination you can put through here in terms of a point efficiency. The Seraph now, um, note that the Seraph used to be just the Spitfire profile, which would also have the Orc spot with it. You cannot declare a coordinated order that involves a Seraph uh, because of its Orc spot, but now we have a version of the Seraph that does not have an Orc spot, so it can benefit from the coordinated order, and that is especially important when Joan of Arc is leading the list. So you may have Joan of Arc in there plus the Seraph. It can move along with the coordinated order from the Lieutenant's uh, token, and then it can tactically wear uh, another order, then maybe get another 10 orders on it after that, and it's jumping around, jumping around, blasting people with its HMG. Very powerful tag. It's also uh, had three points deducted, uh, which is useful. Um, maybe you're not going to see many, much use of that orc spot, so you save yourself three points. That can be a big deal. Very good at bashing objectives and things in close combat with its explosive close combat weapon in Fizz 16. The only real weakness of this guy is that he's just got armor 7, despite being a main battle tag. Uh, or at least I think he's a main battle tag. Um, so armor 7, BTS 6 is a little bit weaker than normal for tags. Willpower 12, also a little bit weak for discovering things uh, and that, that kind of uh, play. Uh, and he's got no, um, no mods like MSV or Mimetism or anything like that, so he will sometimes lose shootouts, but with Blissical 15, you can expect him to do a lot of damage. And of course, HMG going up to damage 16 with Fatality Level 1 on there. So I like to run a Seraph if it's a limit insertion uh, military orders list. And um, that example I gave you earlier with the Father Knight Link Team plus Seraph is pretty cool. Although you could equally well design some sort of Joan of Arc uh, list. It's just that Joan of Arc probably wouldn't be leading the Hospitaliers and have a Seraph in there because there's just not enough points for that. We also have the Tick Belong, and you'll have to help me out here, guys, because I couldn't really make sense of this. For some reason, uh, the Military Orders Tick Belong is completely different from the uh, Acontecimento version because this guy loses anti-personnel mines and instead has an AP HMG, which isn't really a very good kind of AP, uh, um, uh, HMG. Like, AP doesn't really help in a lot of cases. Whereas the mines were legitimately a good way of defending him. Um, he was otherwise a little bit of a uh, weak a ta a tag in the defensive turn, despite his heavy flamethrower, because people can just throw smoke next to him and kill him that way, whereas the mine is very, very useful. The other thing is that he seems to have gone up in cost, um, and that's probably because of tactical awareness coming in there, but also the cost is even more than the Acontecimento one, uh, given that he's now got the H AP HMG, but I just don't feel like the points increase was really merited, given that he lost the mines along the way. So 92 points for this guy. He's got Armor 6, BTS 6. It's a real struggle for me to justify taking a guy like this. In Acontecimento, yes, I can see him in your list sometimes. And Vanilla Pano as well, yes, I can see him in there sometimes. But again, I do feel that this is one of the models that has suffered from the points increase that's come along with Tactical Awareness. It's just not quite as efficient as I would like in terms of the, the overall points to uh, capability ratio. So I'm not 100% sold. Nearing the end of the review now, let's go through the last part. So bullet here arm bots um, have always been one of the best things about Pan Oceania. They always make other factions jealous. Even though you've got so many cool toys and link teams in this sectorial, um, honestly, you can't go wrong with just relying on this guy as your attack piece anyway, instead of your tag or whatever you may be doing. Throw in your bullet here, have a spec, spec order sergeant um, hacker to put a sister fire on him. And if you're not going to be dedicated to like supporting a tag or supporting your biker knight or your um, light grenade launcher or your your link team, 
then throwing the sky in there and just um, having that as your attack piece is the way to go. And to, to be honest, the Spitfire option is always going to be better than the heavy shotgun option. We've seen this time and time again, and we've seen him in so many games, and we've seen this guy do so well in many more games than the games where he's uh, failed to perform. Clipper drone bots. Um, Again, uh, smart missile launchers are one of the weakest things in Infinity at the moment, despite uh, various things which have made them a little bit more viable. And they happen to be in the one faction where they're, they're probably the weakest. Pano probably has the least number of options for getting that uh, guard, guided fire targeting down, as far as I know. So don't take one of those. Uh, Fugazi drone bot, it's a shame you can only take one, but you will want to take him a lot of the time because he's a very important cheap cheerleader. Mule bots, I would like to take a couple of these guys, unless it's just a, a limit insertion list where I need the slots in the order group. Evo hacking device is generally only going to be useful for missions where he gives a bonus or if you are going to be running the Crusader. The total reaction bot, not particularly good with just a combi rifle at 21 points. Uh, Pal bots, we know what they do, extending the reach of your, your engineer doctor. Pathfinder, oh sorry, coming back to Pellbots, don't forget that you can have a Pellbot for your um, your Hospitalia Doctor. Don't forget the, the ability to use that there as well. Pathfinder, uh, again, um, you may be lacking some decent specialists in the sectorials, so don't be afraid to use the Pathfinder as your go-to um, you know, button presser. And sensor can be very useful as well if you're worried about Shinobu or some owner woman jumping up from the middle of the field. Um, or if there's if it's a mission where there's that central objective you're expecting a ninja to pop out of at the end of the game, sensor is the way to go there since nothing else really has sensor that I can remember. Peacemakers, a lot of people like them. I don't particularly like them just for the main argument that you're not always going to take the first turn. And in games where you're not taking the first turn, mechanized deployment is kind of a bad idea for this guy because he's a bit of a liability then. Imagine having this guy out halfway up the table, but not taking first turn, and your opponent moves over to him and uses him as a repeater to kill your hackers, and uh, and then just shuts him down, right? So uh, he's a bit of a liability there. And even when you are going first, a few things have to be correct. You've got to be able to get into the right range bands. You've got to set up assisted fire. Um, your little bot's not going to be a liability. You've got to not get hacked or jammed. Uh, I think that the bulleteer is the better way to go because it's only going to take him one order to get from the deployment zone to the middle of the field anyway. Then after that, you've got a guy with ODD instead of a guy that doesn't have ODD. And honestly, ODD in the games that I've seen is generally more useful than this sidekick bot. Yes, there's occasionally going to be that amazing money game where you go in with the flamethrower and the heavy shotgun or the spitfire and you just wreck them. But I just don't think that's going to happen a, a very high percentage of the time. Sierra drone bots, don't be afraid to take them, despite having the amazing guns in this army. If you're going for that big robust list with lots of water sergeants and lots of cheerleading bots, the Sierra drone bots might be the way to go. But um, remember, they've got a lot of aero, a lot of other aero pieces in this faction that you can use instead. The Panzerfaust Magister Knights, Missile Launcher Magister Knights, the Missile Launcher Father Knights. You don't have to just go for your um, your drone bots here. And of course, don't forget the Order Sergeant TO camo. There's a lot of ways to defend with shooting in military orders, which I really appreciate. Then lastly, Dart. It's really cool that she's made her way into the sectorial because it gives you a piece that you really just don't have access to anywhere else. Um, she just does close range skirmishing much better than the uh, Order Sergeants, uh, in my view. Because she's got that amazing equipment, the EM grenades, the submachine gun for shock, very useful. Climbing plus, the, the viral bow if you want to take it over the EM grenades. Um, having mines is kind of cool. NWI, um, don't forget that she doesn't have any shock immunity. Oh, sorry, she does. Bio, bio immunity and NWI. So much more resilient than an order sergeant. If you're playing a mission that doesn't really require a lot of button pressing... Um, she might be more of the way to go, or if you're planning on a bit more of a lethal um, assassination approach, decapitation, that kind of thing, this is where she can really shine, just deploying halfway out there and moving in and just getting a kill on something really important like a tag or a lieutenant or something really crucial to the back of their lines. MSV-1, you know, surprise attack, She really VS-13 as well, she's a really good killer target. If it's something like tic-tac-toe or comm center or um, a mission like countermeasures, I think that going back to the order sergeants is better because they're more cost effective. They are specialists. They can um, sit there and passively get the work done midfield without having to spend too much. So that's really the trade-off there. Dart's better at stuff that doesn't require whip checks onto things, um, you know, 
at a specialist capacity, whereas the infiltrating order sergeants are best for the other thing. If you really want to take a risk with her as well, you could even uh, take advantage of her physical 13 to deploy on their side of the table with a uh, infiltration roll, but it is risky. So it's a 50-50 shot to deploy right next to them. But if you do pull it off, she could be throwing EM grenades as of the very first order, which is pretty sick. Great, well this has been an overview of Military Orders, hope you guys liked it. Military Orders are a really interesting faction, very thematic, very fun, um, they're great for um, coherent sort of looking armies. Uh, they do have some weaknesses, they do require a fair bit of skill to play. They aren't just about charging and tanking um, hits with their armor, they have a lot of stealth to them, they have a lot of um, covert uh, themes going on. And um, they're quite uh, quite showy with their um, their little brand of, of different houses they belong to, the little um, little orders. So you've got the Hospitaliers here, the Santiago's here, the um, Teuton Teutons over there. I think it's really kind of cool how they uh, are broken down to the various different little groups. Um, and I hope you guys learned something from this video. I really enjoyed uh, running you through this. I don't own any Panayoshin uh, models anymore. But um, the times I, I, I was playing Joan of Arc, I really, really enjoyed. And if I was, go, was to go back to um, Military Orders, which I might do at one point in the, in the future, I really will be playing a lot of Father Knights and Magisters, that is for sure. Hope you guys have a good day, and we'll see you next time.